Hey, good evening, church family. I am so excited to be here to worship with you tonight. I'd like for you to grab your Bible and maybe something to take notes on and sit down with me as we continue our series called The Church. So we're simply going through and looking at some of kind of the basic overview understanding of the church that we have. Um, you know, we've looked so far at some of the structure of the church. We've looked at the authority of the church. And tonight, I'd like to take a minute and look at the organization of the church because I don't know that there is any part of our corporate worship that can get more misunderstood than the way the church is organized. Um, when we look at that, we begin to look at the leadership of the church and how that's kind of broken down. And we've touched on that in different lessons before. We'll go deeper in that tonight. But you know, you might be asking the question, well, Keaton, why in the world is organization even something that we would care about? And I would suggest to you, and, and I can't take credit for this, I read this a long time ago, but I was reading at one point that organization points us to purpose. And I really, really liked that idea, especially in regards to, to the church. Because on the surface, you might think, well, organization, who cares? But when you recognize that the way something is organized will oftentimes give you indications as to its purpose, as to its quality, as to a lot of the different things, um, you begin to see how organization matters within the church. We recognize that the church is organized a certain way to help lead the church, to help further the church. You recognize that it's designed this way because God is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. So tonight, I'd like to just kind of dive into that topic a little bit with you and help kind of offer you maybe a little bit of clarity on the organization of the church. If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and particularly, we're going to look at verse 40. Now, Paul spends a great deal of time talking to a lot of different churches so he touches on the church in a lot of different ways, um, sometimes kind of giving them the thumbs up for things they're doing right. Sometimes he's kind of working with them on things they're doing wrong. But notice what he says to the church at Corinth in, in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse 40. He says, but all things should be done decently, and notice this, and in order. Organization, order, structure is something that you should desire in your life. And, and, and that extends far beyond just the organization of the church. You know, our families, as much as it doesn't feel this way sometimes, should strive to be organized and in order. Our relationships should be in order. Um, you know, that's not to say that they have to be stuffy or they have to be, you know, so a certain thing. But it does mean that there should be some framework within there. Um, so, you know, just in the same way that we have, you know, let's go back to marriage for a, sec for a second. You know, marriages can take the, can go a lot of different directions, um, can have a lot of different flavors. You know, no two people are the exact same, so no two marriages are the exact same. But as Christians, we are called to have some framework within there. Um, you know, if we claim to be Christians, then we agree or should agree with the Bible's stance on marriage. That is, you know, a man and a woman get married. They leave their father and their mother. They join, they make a new union that's connected to God. Um, you know, that's some very basic framework. And, you know, sometimes people don't love to have to work within that. But God has always intended our life to follow an organizational pattern. And that's true even within the church. So if I were to ask you the question, do you believe that the church has a purpose? Or maybe a better way to phrase that would be, what is the purpose of the local church. My hope is that at very minimum, the first part of that question, you would say, yes, I believe the church has a purpose. I would hope that you could articulate in one way or another what that purpose is. Why was the church established? And as much as we like to talk about that, because if you were to ask me to sum up the church in a couple words or a couple sentences, it would go something along the lines of, the church is the body of Christ. And, and again, we might need to make some designation. Are we talking about the local church or the church at large? But let's talk about the local church for a second because that's the, the kind of the framework within this class. So the local church is the body of Christ in a local area that worships together and that serves a particular community. Now, that may not be the most eloquent or the most technical 
But I think kind of in everyday speech, that is the definition of the local church. We come together, which, you know, if you're local to us in Savannah and, and worship with us is central, then, you know, that, that, that right there, that sentence describes the local church. We all live in Savannah. We have decided to uh, align ourselves with the Central Church of Christ. That's one uh, congregation within the Savannah area. And we aim to do God's work together. So there is a purpose. The purpose is to serve, to worship, to fellowship. All of those are aims of the church. So if we believe that the church has that purpose, that, that, that uh, mission, if you will, then, and we also believe that God is a God of order, and we believe that organization points us to purpose, then we can really start connecting the dots and you see how valuable understanding the organization of the church is. I will assert to you that without organization, the church is going to be hard-pressed, if not incapable, of fulfilling its mission. Because listen to how this scenario might go. The organization of the church, and we won't get too far into it because that's really what this whole class, this lesson in particular is all about, but we look at the organization of the church, and I've touched on this a little bit already, but we see the elders are at the top. They're the shepherds or the overseers, and then we have kind of the members, and then we have servant leaders. Now, the elders, deacons, ministers, and members are all part of the membership, so elders are not... Um, they are members, is my point. Um, deacons and, mem and ministers are members, but the elders do go above and beyond that. They are the shepherds of the congregation. So if those shepherds didn't exist and we kind of left it free for all, then that would allow for, you know, at Central, you know, we've got 115, 120 people that call Central home. And if we did not have an eldership that came together and said, this is what's best for the church, we would have some that would want to, to guide the church in this direction. We would have some that would want the church to go in this direction. We would have some that would want to go the church in this direction. All of those might be fine and dandy, but if we aren't unified in one direction, we're going to end up going nowhere. And that honestly is just one potential pitfall for if we didn't have organization put in place. Um, let's think a little bit more broad, you know, beyond just elderships and stuff like that. When we talk about the organization of the church, um, you know, we have decided, the elders have decided that we're going to meet at a certain time. What if we didn't have a set meeting time? You might think, well, that's a, a really arbitrary thing to think about, but what, what if we didn't have that? What if there wasn't a time that we could say, hey, we're meeting at, you know, 9.30, 10.30, 5 o'clock. We could share that with other people. Can you imagine how much less effective and how much more chaotic our church life would be? Um, again, silly example, but you begin to see how organization matters. And, and it really does, if it's not there, it's a, it's a massive pitfall in our aim at pushing the church forward. So let's kind of transition now into the organization. We've touched on it a little bit. One of the most important things, and I've preached on this before, in fact, the graphic that I've been using for this class, you may recognize if you've um, if been with us at Central for a couple years, because I think two years ago now, going on three, time flies, but um, a couple years ago, I did a series on the church, um, right around the time that we installed uh, Steve Yoho as a elder at Central. Um, we, we kind of led up to that with a, a series on the church, and we looked at elders and deacons and um, the, the aim of the church and all that kind of stuff. But tonight, I want to kind of start looking at the organization of the church by looking at the eldership, because it really has to start there. So we look at the necessity of an eldership. Now, here's a question I get a lot. Can a church function without an eldership? Is, is there a, uh, a proper way to do this? And, and I would say that the short answer to this is yes, a church can function without an eldership. In fact, I've been a member at a congregation without an eldership in the past. Uh, you may have also. So it can happen. There, there's a few things that it cannot be. Um, for one, you cannot have one elder. Uh, it, there must be a, 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 at least two or more, uh, preferably more, but, but you have to have at least two. 
And of course, they have to meet the qualifications. But if that's not possible, the church is able to function without an eldership. Now, I would assert to you this, that the church is really going to struggle to grow and thrive without an eldership. And we've talked about that already briefly. Um, why is that? Is that because, you know, people are different without an elder? No. What it really means is that an eldership functions because it guides the local church. You've got men that have met a very kind of rigorous criteria to become an elder. So when you've got that, you you hopefully have your most qualified, experienced, mature members within your congregation that are now stepping up to be elders that are going to guide that ship. Um, so in a very real way, they are, are going to be the ones that are going to kind of position where you're going to go. Without that, it becomes very difficult to kind of have a unified vision. It's not impossible, but the, you know, the really the other way that I've seen it done that if there aren't elders, then typically you kind of gather the men of the congregation together and they make decisions. But the problem with that is when you get 10, 15 people together, it becomes much more difficult to make choices. That's why, you know, very seldomly do you see elderships that large, even at big congregations. Because people realize that when you get up beyond five, six, seven people, it's not impossible to make decisions. Um, but but it's 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 a lot more opinions to contend with. So, you know, typically you've got an eldership somewhere between well, two at a minimum, and again six, seven, eight. Now, not to say that you can't have more. I know of a couple really big congregations that do have ten, eleven, twelve elders, but they would even tell you that that is a lot more to manage. It's a lot more to deal with. So, no, uh, you a church can be scriptural without elders. However. The church is designed to function with them. So as soon as a congregation is able to appoint at least two elders, um, the hope is that that will happen. So I want to talk to you briefly about the office of eldership, and I want to give you kind of three titles or descriptors that elders are given that kind of help point us to some of, and we won't spend a lot of time, we're not going to go through the, the, the full length, the, the qualifications of elders or anything like that. But the office of the eldership is described in three different ways within the New Testament. First is as elder. And the literal Greek translation there is translated presbyter. And what that actually is referring to is that these should be older men. So, uh, you know, again, when we look at the um, qualifications of elders, you know, they have to be married. They have to have children. um, They have to be within good standing within the community. Um, All of that kind of guides us to this idea of, you know, they have to manage their family, and that just kind of comes with time and experience. So, again, when we talk about elder, you know, not that they're ancient by any means, but that they are usually older men, and that's what we should value. They've got experience. They've got uh, life to offer. Um, So, again, we we look at this office of elder. We also see the word uh, bishop which when we look at the literal translation, it comes out as overseer. So we again see this understanding that our elders oversee the church, the flock. And then lastly, one that you've heard me talk about before that gets misused all the time is pastor, which actually is the literal translation to shepherd. So when we think about our elders shepherding the flock, you and I are the flock, um, that's from the phrase pastor. So if you want verses, I, we, we can't look at all these tonight, but elder comes from Acts 14, verses 23, and then chapter 20 and verse 17. Bishop comes from Acts 20 and 17 and verse 28. And then pastor comes from Acts 20, 17, 28, and 1 Peter 5, 1 and 2, if you want to look those up later. So it's important to note that those aren't three separate offices. Those are three descriptors of the same office, the office of the eldership. Again, elders are appointed after they have went through a very rigorous series of qualifications. We don't have time to go through all of those tonight, but if you want to look at them, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and Titus chapter 1, 5 through 9 gives us the full descriptors of what um, an elder is to have. Um, you know, and, and there's been some debate over the years as interpretations of a few of those, but by and large, they're very self-explanatory. 
Um, and, and again, we won't go through that now, but we'll go through that at a, at a later point. Now, one thing I do want to mention just for your edification as we're thinking about this, again, we won't look through the whole list, but if you go into 1 Timothy 3 and start looking at, or even in Titus, and look at the qualifications of elders, you will see that an elder must meet all of these qualifications. If we look in 1 Timothy 3, it says, therefore, an overseer must. So it's saying that if you want to become an elder, these are the qualifications that you must meet in order to do that. And it is a lengthy list. So where a lot of people get into trouble from time to time is congregations, especially those that don't yet have elders, will begin to say, man, I know we really need elders. We want elders. So do we have any men that you know fit most of this? Um, you know, is there a man that fits the, the, the majority of these qualifications? And then they'll appoint them as elders. But the, the fallacy there is, again, Scripture is telling us that these elders must meet all of these qualifications. They must be married. They must have kids. They must be hospitable. They must be, you know, a, a seasoned Christian. They must be able to teach. There's all these qualifications. And if an elder doesn't meet one of those, then they aren't qualified. That's why, you know, we at, you know, within the church take elders and deacons for that matter. Now deacons are, you know, that word deaconos that we get our word deacon literally just means servant. So, you know, it's not like, el you know, deacons are junior elders or anything like that. I've heard that at different congregations before, but um, deacons really are just uh, members that are serving above and beyond that, you know, they're usually specializing in one area or another. Um, but, you know, there are qualifications for deacons too, and there are qualifications really for even for ministers. Now, they're not quite as laid out and explicit as elder or deacon, but, you know, ministers, it says if you're going to teach the gospel of Christ, you know, you're going to be held to a higher standard. So, you know, there are qualifications we have, and we're called that, you know, when we appoint elders or deacons, that they're supposed to meet these qualifications. So, two more points that I want to, and we'll close up on elders, we'll move on to deacons for tonight. But when we look, and I'll give you some references, again, this is a big topic. I almost broke this up into two lessons, but I really kind of wanted to leave it as one for our pacing. Um, but we look in and we see the plurality of the eldership. You've, I've already referenced this once before, but you know, we look and I want to give you some references just so if you want to look up and study this further. You know, when we look and read in every congregation within Scripture, we see them talking to elders, plural. So that's what gives us an indication that the office of elder is supposed to be more than one, so at least two. You know, if we look in Acts chapter 14, it talks about they're revealing the elders. If we look in Acts 15, if we look in Acts 16 verse 21, or and chapter 21, it says that the, the elders in Jerusalem, the elders in Ephesus in 1 Timothy chapter 5, um, when someone was sick and they needed the prayers of the elders in James chapter 5. Um, in 1 Peter 5, it talks about young people submitting to their elders. Um, remember that word elders just referring to them being older in age. So again, the plurality of the eldership is essential. There cannot be one elder. The second part of this that we see is the autonomy of the church. This is important. Um, you know, I'm not in the business of, of bashing any other faith tradition, any other denomination, anything like that. But we do see in Scripture a mandate, and so all I'm going to do is kind of point us to what the Bible does say. And so when we look in Scripture in Acts 14, in 1 Peter, 1, or 1 Peter 5, in Philippians chapter 4, we see some very clear understandings of the autonomy of the church. What that means is that each individual church is independent of each other and that elders are over one congregation. So we see here that each church is independent of each other. That's important because there's a lot of denominations in the world today that kind of have like a central um, office, if you will. They report back to uh, a governing body, and, and that's just not what we see in Scripture. Um, elders are limited to the oversight of one congregation. 1 Peter 5 and verse 2 talks about limiting the eldership to one flock. Um, you know, we look in Philippians 4 and 1 Corinthians 16, each church is local and independent of each other, and that includes money. Each church has its own treasury that it spends money on, you know, missions, benevolence, ministers, all these kinds of things. And so each church is independent of each other, and that includes its eldership. Let's transition now to looking at deacons. 
deacons are to serve the eldership and the congregation. I mentioned this already. The word deaconos really does mean servant. And so deacons are called to serve. So if we look in 1 Timothy chapter 3, we see the qualifications of deacons. Very similar to the qualifications of elders, but a few slight differences. Now, this is kind of Keaton's opinion, but we, we look at kind of the standard for deacon in Scripture. If you look in Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1, there were seven men that were appointed to particular jobs um, within the first century. And to me, this looks very similar to the institution of deacons. These are men that are just called to serve in a very particular role. Um, I think that's kind of one of, our, one of our earliest patterns for deacons within Scripture. But that's the way deacons are called to now. They have a set of qualifications that we, we hope that they will meet. And then they're called to serve above and beyond, but they are still members of the church, just like me and you. So I'd like to wrap up by looking at you and I, which is just members of the church. And I'd like to look at one verse in particular. There's a couple places we could go in Scripture, but this one's my favorite, and that's Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 11. So I'd like to read Ephesians 4, starting verse 11 for you and going down through verse 16. And, and this is going to talk to the body of Christ. So listen as we read Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, by deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working together properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Now this gives us the body of Christ. You and I, and the word that is most often translated as the body or members, is the word saints, which just literally means holy one. Or, and again, that, that word holy just means set apart. So if you and I are striving to be Christians and we're members of the church, we're called saints. So when we look here, it says, and he gave the apostles, um, and we look, we know what that word means, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers. So let's notice briefly the difference here. We see the distinction between evangelists, which is really, you know, all of I, you know, let's back up for a second. Um, evangelists can refer to to me as, as a minister, but it also refers to us as just members of the church. Um, there really isn't a special distinction there. You and I are both called to evangelize, which means just teaching those that are lost, that don't know Christ. The shepherds, we've already talked about that, that's the elders, and the teachers. And so teachers, again, refer to, it could refer to me um, as, as your minister, but it, it very obviously refers to you also as members that we're called to teach each other. Um, I'm not the only one, far from it, that teaches at Central. Um, if you don't worship with us at Central, your congregation probably has a whole host of people that teach each other. Um, and that's what it's referring to here. But then it goes on to say, um, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. You and I, as members, are called to be workers. We're called to go out and to teach and to preach and to fellowship and to do all these kinds of things. So I hope that through the through this lesson, um, again, we've kind of went all over the place, but we've looked a little bit at the organization of the church. We've looked at the office of elder. We've looked at the office of deacon. And we've looked at what is most prevalent within our churches, which is members, you and me. We're called to be evangelists. We're called to be teachers. We're called to love one another. And so I hope this has kind of helped. Again, if we believe that organization leads to purpose, then by organizing ourselves in this way, then we are pointing to Christ, which is our purpose. I'd like to pray for us, and then we'll wrap it up for um, the evening. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God, Lord, we're so thankful to come before your throne we're thankful to study your church and the way that you've organized it, and we're thankful for that organization. We're thankful for our elders, for our deacons, and God, we're thankful to be members of your church. God, we just ask that you continue to be with us throughout the remainder of this week, that you would allow us to be shining lights in the world, that you would give us opportunities to serve, 
that we would view the organization of your church as as important as it is. We see you put a precedence on it, and we, we hope that we will also. God, we ask that you forgive us where we do fail you. We know we do that often. And Lord, we just ask that uh, you watch over us and guide us and be with our world and our country, that you would bring it back into harmony soon and that you would heal it as soon as you see fit. Let's call these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Friends, what a pleasure it's been to worship with you tonight. I hope that this has been a blessing to you. I hope you've learned something about the church. And if you would, uh, I hope you'll join me tomorrow and Friday as we have some Curious Christian videos. And I'll see you uh, either digitally or in person this Sunday. Can't wait to see you there.